Lesson 29 of the Minor Prophets. It's over a half a year already studying this. Only in the book of Hosea. But we did have a lot of introductory material to get to the point of understanding what these minor prophets, especially the pre-exilic prophets, are uh, the message they're trying to get out to the people of their times. Uh, it's important that we understand that so that we know as we're going through it just what the, the people were facing and why the Lord was so upset with them. So today we are going to be looking at the fourth chapter of Hosea. Remember the first three chapters were the analogy, I guess is the best way to say it, word picture where Hosea was commanded to take a wife of harlotry and uh, have children, at least one child with her, ends up she has three children, uh, but that would set a context for Israel, the northern kingdom's spiritual adultery against God or against the Lord. Uh, how that they had uh, gone off to chase idols, but also in the sense that they were not trusting in the Lord to protect them, to be uh, like a husband to them, and went off and sought the help of other nations when times really got tough when the Lord finally said, hey, uh, you know, I, 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 I brought hardship, trials, tribulations upon you trying to get you to repent. Now with Jeroboam II, I've given you good times and you still haven't repented. I'm done with you. And what do they do? They turn to the other nations for help, particularly with Assyria. Uh, which would be the capital of that is Nineveh. And again, that's where we started in the books of the Minor Prophets was when we looked at Jonah and the rise of Nineveh. How God allowed them to prosper and then uh, through the book of Amos, how they go to, to Nineveh. Hey, Syria is bothering us. Help us. And they become a vassal state of the Assyrians. Boy, that's a bunch of help, isn't it? So all of that picture and how that then uh, last week we looked at how uh, uh, Hosea was to take Gomer back. And that was how the Lord would take Israel back. But there would be conditions. There would be a time period uh, that they'd have to prove themselves, which would be after the exile, uh, come back, they'd have to learn uh, the, the law of Moses, they'd have to get back to temple worship, and they'd have to understand, you'd have to, to get the, the government back, and no kings until Christ comes, and then a brand new covenant, which we understand being the Christian age. So all of that's now behind us, and we're going to look at the Lord's accusation against Israel. And we've studied this, we studied it in Amos, so I think we can go pretty much through this quickly, quicker than what we did with Amos, Lord willing. But listen, whatever it takes for us to understand this, we're going to work through it, okay? So. Amos chapter 4, 19 verses, correct, in this, and starting with verse 1, hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love 
and no knowledge of God in the land. So what's happening? No faithfulness or step. Faithfulness, okay, just like Gomer. Gomer was Hosea's wife, but she's over here. What it, it, is she really it, it just having affairs with other men? Or is she going down to the temples, these fertility cult temples, and having relationships there? in these fertility cults hoping for material gain from that. And we, we discussed that before. Is that what is that what is going on? Is that where the the second and third child the ch children that she bears comes from? Alright? But there's no faithfulness from the nation of Israel and the leaders. We're going to get into the leaders uh, the priests and the, the kings. We've talked about that before. We'll hit it again, uh, uh, I believe, in chapter 5. Okay? So no faithfulness, no steadfast love. And that, that's compassion, isn't it? Or mercy. We would say mercy. The Lord's steadfast love is His is, is mercy toward us. The willingness to forgive. But they're not forgiving. Not, and, and, and what are we told if, if we want to have mercy, what do we need to do according to the Sermon on the Mount? Be merciful. Be merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. But, see, they wanted mercy, but they didn't want to be merciful people. And there's no knowledge of God in the land. Why? Because their culture from the time of Jeroboam the first. Hey, I built this golden calf down here in Bethel. We're going to put another one up in Dan. You don't need to go down to the temple in Jerusalem to worship anymore. So you can go here, you can go there. You know, one God's as good as another, right? You know, one, one religion is as good as another. One church is as good as another. You just do this, and then all of a sudden you've got these cultures coming in, and God, or the Lord, Yahweh, it is pushed out. So where the people don't know, and there's other passages that talk about, you know, my children, or your children don't even know about the Lord. They just know what people say about the Lord, but they don't know the Lord. And... Uh, your children have learned the language of Ashdod. Okay? So, you know, how many children today don't understand the basics of the Bible, the morality and ethics of the Bible, they just understand what culture coming out of Europe for the last 150 years is teaching them. The, the, basically the principles of Marxism. The, there, there is no God. Atheism. But, and if there's no God, there's no such thing as morality and there's no such thing as ethics. Except the you know, morality and ethics is if you say that there's morality and ethics, you're wrong. <laughs> That's... There's no morale. There's no morality. There's no ethics. Truly, in other words, there's no moral absolutes. But the only moral absolute is you can't say that somebody's wrong. But the one thing you can say everybody's wrong about is if they say there's moral absolutes. It doesn't make sense. You understand what we're saying there? You know. Well, they're facing same, they were facing the same things basically that we're facing. That's why they didn't want Amos up there preaching. Hey, you go back down south and preach back down there in Judah. We don't want to hear that. We want to hear what the other, what's going on in these other nations. They're, they're smarter than you Yahweh-loving people back down there. You Bible thumpers, you know. You're, you're backwards. You're, you're hillbillies. You're Neanderthals, right? Yeah. 
All right. No knowledge of God in the land. Verse 2. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, committing adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Right? So, what's going on here? Swearing is mentioned in the third commandment. You know, they, they had ten commandments, right? And that's what they were supposed to follow. Uh, so, they would have no other gods before them. And what they would say is, well, we don't have any other gods before the Lord. The Lord's number one. Baal's number two. You know. Well, that's not what that means. No other gods. Well, no. None before you. That's how we interpret it. But Baal, Baal and Asherah had actually become more than Yahweh. But you take an oath, you know, to the Lord, you know, swearing. They, they take their oaths to Baal, to the temple of Baal, to whatever. So that's the type of swearing that we're talking about here. And if you, if you swear to a false god, is there going to be any ramifications for that from that false god? No, 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 because there's no morals, there's no ethics, all right? So you have swearing, you have lying, which is what, the ninth commandment? You shall not bear false witness. Murder's the sixth commandment. Stealing's the seventh commandment. Adultery is the eighth commandment. What are they doing? <laughs> They're breaking half the commandments right there but they've already broken the first one. No other gods before me. You know, don't, don't put them up there. Just don't put them up there. No other gods. And uh, how, how about parents? You know, honor your parents. Well, how are they honoring their parents? Well, look what happens in culture. What's one of the first places that the outside culture goes to to destroy a culture that is based upon biblical standards. The family. The family. Destroy the family. That's what they're trying to do right now. Okay? Uh, so you can see where Israel was going. You can make the comparisons to today. But again, this was for them. We see the problems, we ought to be awake to the problems, right? The second part of verse two, bloodshed follows bloodshed. So what does that mean? It's just constant. The killing, the murder, it was just, it was everywhere. And you go to court, you're not going to get a good, uh, uh, fair judgment. In fact, remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? You, 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 if somebody sues you for your cloak, your coat, whatever, give it to them. Because you might just go to court and end up losing, you know, being thrown into debtor's prison or something. Agree with your adversary before you get there. Because in this world, Judgment is not certain. Now, on Judgment Day, judgment will be certain. But in this world, you don't get it. And, and you think about the bloodshed follows bloodshed. Remember about uh, Na Nabo, back in the days of Ahab and Jezebel. Remember, Ahab wanted that vineyard. I can't sell it. This was a, an inheritance from my family that God gave, and it goes to my family when I die. I cannot sell it. Oh, they have one. He goes, he's crying and on his bed, you know, stent, throwing his hands and stent. He says, oh, Jezebel says, what's the matter with you? You're the king. Well, he wasn't going to do it, but she, I'll get it for you. She has me both killed. 
that just bloodshed, bloodshed. They didn't care. They didn't care. Kill somebody? What difference does it make? You get what you want, even if you have to kill somebody. Now the ramifications of that, look at verse 3. Therefore the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish. Also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and even the fish of the sea are taken away. Now that, that's all figurative language, but what's, what's the Lord trying to say through Hosea? Is that the way, when, when, okay, put it in terms that we might understand today, you've got people who are doing terrible things to other people on the on their basis of environmental justice. Look what's going to happen in Europe. People will probably freeze to death in Europe this winter because of laws, rules, regulations, stuff that people are doing. The land is going to hurt. Did you ever see uh, movies or, or even uh, you know, the Civil War? Why was the Civil War really important in turning people's minds about war? Because it was the first war where you had photographs of what happened. And you see the devastation like a battle after Antietam. Some of those battles where they, they fought for two or three days and then you go out on those battlefields and you see the dead, and you see there, the no, there are no trees left standing because everything's just been blown apart. Or you think about that, that in World War II, after the bombs are dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? And you see that. The land is mourning because of what human beings have done as bloodshed follows bloodshed. What if they had just followed the Lord and counted on the Lord to protect them? And we've talked about it before. You know, well, what, what happened at Jericho? How big of a battle was that? But we got a song about it, right? Uh, uh, Joshua won the battle of Jericho. Did Joshua win the battle of Jericho? The Lord did. The Lord did. They marched around the city, blew a trumpet, and the walls fell down. That was the battle of Jericho. It's, it's... They didn't trust the Lord. So the, the land mourns. And, and as, as we as human beings, beings try to impose our will as human beings. And, and understand, I understand God gave Adam, gave man dominion over the earth and the things on the earth, the animal life all. But that dominion should have been used according to God's will. What did Adam do? Adam gave it over to the devil. And since that time, it's been what God created good, the devil has been destroying, destroying, destroying. And what has the devil been using to destroy? <laughs> Human beings. Human beings. Right? So, Romans chapter Eight. Verses 18 through 25. Paul, the Apostle Paul talking about future glory, says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not to compare, are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the Son. This is where 
we could we can talk about the new heavens and the new earth and we did talk about that in the heaven and hell right lance remember that new heavens and new earth you know the new heavens and the new earth and new jerusalem coming down you know a new dwelling place even creation to a degree is is looking for that waiting for that because what that what was their death in in the garden of eden did the plant life die did the animals that were there did they die we don't know but if they didn't what happens after the garden is shall we say taken away at the flood well the world is in a state of decay just like man dies so it's waiting for the revealing of the sons of god verse 20 for the creation was subjected to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We look for the new heavens and new earth because we know we're not going to die anymore. Uh, it's going to be different, but it's what what is the, the parallel, so to speak, uh, spoken of in the book of Revelation? Well, it's like the garden restored, isn't it? A return to paradise but there'll be no sin because the devil's thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone and everything that, that's bad and evil you know but even creation is waiting for that looking for that yearning for that verse 23 for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. You understand, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Okay. What, what, what does that mean? Well, the, I, I don't want to get fully developed into, but in the book of Joel it talks about uh, that In, under the new covenant, the, the Holy Spirit would come to dwell in us, all right? And that happens on the day of Pentecost, okay? Those who were baptized, uh, re believed, repented, and were baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins received the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But that's the first fruits. All right. Not talking about the miraculous. We're talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit until we reach at that age, that time in the resurrection when we are fully mature spiritual beings. Even though we've got, we'll have bodies, it'll be different. We don't want to be like what First John chapter two, verse two, or whatever. But anyway. Then we have the fullness, right? Uh, but we who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. What is that? That's the redemption of our bodies. We have the redemption of our spirits to a degree because we've become the children of God, but we're going to have a redemption of these bodies at the resurrection. Follow along. All right. Verse 24. For this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Patience. So you see that kind of a connection that therefore the land mourns well the land is in this constant turmoil that as long as there are human beings in rebellion toward god 
and to word the Lord, Yahweh, as we recognize today as Jesus Christ. Okay? As long as they are in rebellion, what's the what's creation doing? What's the land doing? It's mourning because what that there are wars and rumors of wars. And there's what did we just go through the last couple of years? A pandemic. Is that man's fault? And even if it wasn't man's fault, it's because we live in a fallen world. Though I believe it was man's fault. I believe it was wrong. So, so you see the connections. And that's what I'm trying to do. Make the connections. Not saying that this is prophesied for our day, but we can see overall how God works. And how nature is working. How human beings are working. And the difference between those who are uh, subjecting themselves to the rule of God through Jesus Christ, how they are as opposed to those who are in rebellion to God by being in rebellion to Jesus Christ and in rebellion to the Word of God. Well, it's a spiritual battle, isn't it? And that spiritual battle goes on. Okay. Do you have questions on this or comments? Uh, so, even the few innocent people of Israel would suffer because of the sins of the elite. And yes, we have that creation suffers as a result of the fall of man. So, Hosea chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Rough priests and prophets. Yeah, here's the chapter 5. Okay. Yet let no one contend, and let no one accuse, for with you is my contention, O priest. Now that's what they did with Amos, wasn't it? The, the priest at Bethel contended with Amos. Amos, don't be talking like that up here. You go back down where you belong. But Hosea said, hey, don't let anybody contend. You, you just don't need to even argue about this. And don't you be accusing God's prophets, or, or even the Lord, for with you is my contention, O priest. And he's talking about the priests of Baal and Ashtoreth, but he's also talking about a few of the priests who probably still said, well, we're, we're priests of Yahweh. Okay? The legitimate good priests and Levites who were serving Yahweh had already split and gone to, to Judah. They, they had gotten out of there. So the ones who stayed behind, they, they were, shall we say, they were wishy-washy as to the law, right? So he has a contention with the priests. So make it a religious discussion here. Verse 5, you shall stumble by day, and the prophet also shall stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. I destroy your mother? Why, why, why would the Lord destroy their mother? Figurative language. Would you die for your motherland? We say, for God and country, right? 
Well, what's the country often called? The motherland. And what what is the force behind these false priests and false prophets that allow them to do what they are doing? It's actually their mother who's giving them the power because it's the, the state, the, the king of the northern kingdom, Israel, <coughs> who would be the primary <coughs> avenger for these priests and prophets. Remember when we talked about it in the book of Amos, what, what did that priest of the temple at Bethel do? He warned, he warned Amos, and then he ran to the king. King, he, he's saying that you you need to die and this blah 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 blah. Well, what was he doing? What would the king do in that circumstance? Well, I'll just send some troops down there and run him out of town. So, to me, that's kind of what's going on here. Uh, I will. You, you don't need to contend. You don't need to argue, and you know, well, you can, but it's not going to do you any good. And by the way, go ahead and tell the king, you know, because your nation's going to be destroyed. It's going to be wiped out. Get the point there. So it's a figurative language thing that is being used there. Because they rejected uh, the Savior. The priest was to act as a mediator between God and man, right? In fact, you know, one of the, the names for the Pope, they call him the Pontiff, right? Have you ever heard that term, Pontiff? Okay. And what pontiff means is a bridge. So a priest is a bridge between God and man. He stands there. The priest prays to God for the people to make peace between the people and God. The prophet is also a bridge in the sense that he takes a message from God to the people. Now, you, you see the difference. Sometimes a priest can be a prophet, and sometimes a king can be a prophet, but a king can't be a priest, right? So you can't have a king, a priest, and a prophet like Melchizedek in Judaism, and, and this is just a little bit off of what the lesson is. That's why it talks about prophet, priest, and king, all right? You couldn't have one in Judaism. So you could have a king being a prophet, you could have a priest being a prophet, uh, but you couldn't have a priest and a king. Now, Melchizedek was before Judaism, before the law, and that's why Christ would come and be a king and a priest and a prophet along the lines of Melchizedek, and that's what's being talked about in the book of Hebrews. Follow me there. Okay. But again, so here are the corrupt priests. They are to be a bridge between uh, the people and God. All right? And what would they do? The people would come to the priest and say, I have sinned. I need to offer a sacrifice. Who offers the sac who does the work of the sacrifice? What's the priest, right? Because he's the one in between. So as he offers the sacrifice, and we'll get more into this later, uh, the priesthood had become so corrupt there in the northern kingdom that even if they were saying they were a, a worshiping Yahweh, they themselves had been so corrupt, they couldn't even offer sacrifices for themselves, let alone for other people. Because they were, they, 
by them not standing up against Baal and Ashtoreth worshipers, the priesthoods of those, they were actually, shall we say, working for them. If they weren't standing up for what was wrong, they weren't working for what was right. A good example of that was Elijah, right? Elijah on Mount Carmel with the sacrifices, what, 400 prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Ashtar, or something like that. Okay. The Lord accepts uh, Elijah's sacrifice. What happens to those prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth? They're taken down to a stream and they're killed. Should have been the end of it, right? But it wasn't. But it should have been. People, people don't learn. So the prophets or preachers taught that the, what the people wanted to hear, not the truth. And the destruction of the northern kingdom, the motherland, what, what what happens then after that? Well, it's chaos and confusion, right? Now who do you trust? Who do you go to? Who do you go to? Oh, we're on our own. So verse 6, verse 6 and 7, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because, and the, Hosea speaking for the Lord says, because you've rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. So it starts with the priest because they rejected a knowledge of the Lord. It says, okay, in that verse, you shall have no other gods before me. Oh, it's, it, you, you can go worship Baal and then come over here and, and offer a, a sacrifice to, uh, to Yahweh. It's okay. It's okay. You can go down here and worship at the Catholic Church and then come here and worship there. And you go over there and you go over there. It's okay. As, as long as you're here, you know, as long as you do here too, you, you see how they're doing it? But what what is their what is their motivation? Okay? Now we'll get into that later. I'll just throw this out there to you. What happens when a person brings a sacrifice to a priest of Yahweh? What happens? They slaughter it. They slaughter it. And what happens to that sacrifice? Well, they do, but after they kill it, it's like a person. It's destroyed. Part of it goes to the altar and is burned and goes to the Lord or to God. Part of it goes home with the worshiper. That's fellowship. And the rest of it goes to the priest. The priest. How do I get more? Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. This, this is a stretch, but I think it comes to the point here, and, and I think we'll get this in chapter 5. sin that grace may abound. God forbid! Alright? What if the people sin more? Get more sacrifices. They get more sacrifices and if there's more sacrifices I get more portions of the sacrifice. I get more. 
we, we, we talked about the indulgences of the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, how that the priest could write an indulgence. Somebody's going on a journey. Hey, I might sin on this journey, and there may not be a Catholic priest there to give me the, what's that, that final deal? Uh, it's absolution, but there, there's a particular name for the last last rites, okay? And I don't want to die without the last rites, so they're given this abs uh, this uh, indulgence that if, if they sin, that they're going they're going to be all right, even though there's no Catholic priest there to give them the last rites before they die. Right? But they pay for it with money. Right? Well, it's like sin, all right? You go in the confession booth. Oh, Father, it's been two years since my last confession, and I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and I did this. Oh, bless you, child. You, you've sinned, and uh, here, here's what you need to do. Put $100 in the collection box and say 50 Hail Marys. And I'll pray for you and you'll be forgiven. We're not going to get much further than this. How do you get to be Pope? it can turn and become corrupt. Lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 20, when they had God in their mind, you know, when they knew about God, they didn't want to keep them God, they created their own gods. You have that. Uh, I'm going to get through chapter, chapter 4 here. Okay. Uh, Verses 6 and 7, my people are destroyed, are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me. Well, if they're not a priest to him, who are they a priest to? Some idol, and it doesn't have to be a, an idol made of stone or wood. It can be an idol of their own imagination. Right? Well, I... I am a priest of the Lord God. Oh, do you follow the Bible? No, he's told me to do it a different way. Where does it say in the Bible? He told me. He appeared to me and said, do it this way. Ah. No. No. Lots of false prophets out there. You can find that even today. I reject you from being a priest to me, and since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. <laughs> forget the children. 
look, they're going into captivity. Some of them are going to die, some of them are going into captivity, but it's going to be a long time before they get to come back to the land. And they're not going to come back as the nation of Israel, they're going to come back as Judah. Verse 7, and the more they increase, the more they sinned against me. Why? More sin, more coming in and sin offerings, right? I will change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people. There it is, isn't it? They feed on the sin of my people. They are greedy for their iniquity. And it shall be like people, like priests. In other words, it's not the word of God that's determining what is the moral and ethical character of the, the, we'll say, the church. Culture's determining what the church is. And that's exactly what's going on today. Amen. Culture's determining what a church is. You, you people don't accept gays and lesbians and all this blah, 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 blah. Well, that's, that's what culture is. That's what culture's doing. No, that's not what the Word of God says. We, we need to help those people. In fact, Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, isn't it? Look, look at that the list of things there and such were some of you but you've been and basically you've been converted you've been changed you've been born again they weren't perfect people to begin with but there you go the more they increase the more they send against me i will change their glory into shame well, it was their glory, not glory for the Lord, but their glory. Look at us. Look look how open we are because we, we accept Baal and Asherah and, and all these gods from these foreign nations. And, and, and boy, we're okay with, with those uh, <laughs> temple prostitutes down there. Yeah, that's okay. will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. God judges nations in time and people in eternity. And if there's anything we should learn from that that comes to our time, <laughs> We might be right for destruction. You know, Putin may be right. Putin may be right. We may be seeing the end of Western culture because we have allowed it to go so far into degradation that it's going to it's going to destroy itself if it keeps going this way. And Putin's saying, we're not having it. We're not having it here. And those provinces of, of Ukraine, that Ukraine trying to be like the Western world, Western culture, those provinces that are Russian speaking and Russian Orthodox, we may not agree with the Orthodox churches in a lot of things, but they're not accepting it. They're not taking it. They're not allowing it. Verse 10, they shall eat, but not be satisfied. They shall play the whore, but not multiply, because they have forsaken the Lord. They don't multiply, and because they don't multiply, you know what they have to do? They have to indoctrinate other people's children in the school system. Be 
because they have forsaken the Lord to cherish for the wine and new wine which take away the understanding. But where did it start? Where, where did it start? The corruption of the priest. When the priest, when the religious people started saying, oh, we'll, we'll relax, we'll, we'll, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, you know, we, we, we can get along with those Baal worshipers. <laughs> we can get along with those Asher. We, we can get along with those temple prostitutes, you know, that's not going to affect us. And then all of a sudden, we're not going to get to your chapter four. It's like we're reliving history, but the it's just our turn to go through. But you have this. to point out at this point that you have to leave your doors open <clears throat> to teach those who have rebelled against or to convince those who have rebelled against the Lord that you don't have to accept what they're doing. You can't teach them if you don't leave the door open, that's what I'm saying. But you don't have to agree with them. And there, there comes that point where if they're not willing to, for lack of a better word, conform, you have to cast them out as God says they're to be cast out. And these people, these people were talking about weren't going to change. They had proven that. And they were, they were dragging the priesthood down with them. We can't let them drag us into whatever it may be. We still have to contend that we make an effort, do our best, however you want to put it, to convince them of their iniquities. But it, it's, you, you have to have the standards. You got to live by the standards. And when you're talking about helping people change, um, you, you're not going to change a drunkard by going to the saloons and preaching and teaching. Get them the next day when they're in a hangover and preach and teach to them. Okay? They ever hear the 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 it's either Irish or Welsh. Did he? What do you do with a drunken sailor early in the morning? And the things, you know, what a boat captain would do, or maybe not the captain, but the officer of the day. What do you do? You know, sailor's drunk. Well, what do you do? Well, the next morning, you put him in a long boat, you make him row, 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 row. You know, make him suffer, make him suffer. But, you know, there, there, there are ways of doing things. But, uh, well, with, with the sermon today on influence, you know, there, there's going to be a passage here uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You know, don't go to an idol temple. Don't do it. Just, just don't do it. Because that you know, somebody will see you there. And even though an idol is nothing, somebody with a weak conscience 
will see you there and say, well, it must be all right. But then they go and do it, and they're not doing it by faith. Whatever is not of faith is sin. And by that act, you have caused an offense to that individual. So the things that we can can I tell the story, Karen, what you told me yesterday about the guy you saw? I don't care how long you want to say the name. I want to say the name. A member of the church. Uh, I've heard him speak a few times. Karen was someplace and she saw him uh, gambling. What influences that then on other people? And wonder why that complication is dying. Anyway, any questions or comments? No? Good analogy. Very good analogy. Okay. Yes. Thank you.